Uh, Pastor Tony asked me about a month and a half ago to speak today. And I don't get to speak that much anymore because I'm in broadcast. And I've got to speak twice this year, once to the students and once to a bunch of cameras when we, were, uh, when we couldn't meet together. And so I instantly, I went to my office the day he, he asked me to speak and I started writing my message out. And, and I was going to tell you this funny story based upon this picture right here of me skiing in the Rocky Mountains. It's going to pop up. There it is. Um, that's not me. Uh, <laughs> but it, no, I wasn't even close. Um, but it was, you know, we're, I was going to talk about Esther and about for such a time as this and how the church is, has been, been put here for such a time as this. That COVID didn't put um, Jesus at a loss. He was like, okay, this is the time that the church is going to rise up. And it was gonna, I thought it was going to be great. And then a, a couple weeks later, after my message was done, I had a couple of funny other elements to it. And, and then he comes out, oh, by the way, I'm going to be doing a message series during the summer called Comfort Food. And I'm going to take eight psalms and... Because we need some comfort right now in our nation and in our church. And, and he says, when you preach for me on August 16th, I need you to cover a psalm. My plans blew up. And I had to start from scratch. Anybody's plans this year blow up. Any, any type of plans. Now, if you're watching online, what I need you to do, in the public chat, Give us a story about how your plans at some point this year have changed. While I'm telling my story, um, this year in May, my wife and I celebrated our 20th anniversary. And I know, I know, but, but you're, you're, you're wooing. And, but you're, you're wooing because you're like, how has that guy been married 20 years? Because he is so young. I, that's what I get all the time. I get that all the time. And... Um, but my wife and I, we were going to, in May, we were going to New York of all places. Um, and we were doing it first class. We had saved up our money. We were flying first class. We had a, 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 a suite, a corner suite overlooking Times Square. We were going to four, uh, four or five Broadway shows, one of them, which was Hamilton. And uh, we were going to a Yankee game. And to top it all off, on our anniversary, we were going to take this boat ride around the city of New York and... In it was a formal dinner and dancing, and it was just going to be incredible. And all that blew up. So I had to take my money and put it into my house. And who, who cares about the house except for my wife? Um, but if you have your scriptures, turn to Psalm chapter 100 and uh, Matthew chapter 14. The, I believe this is the part we're going to read a perfect psalm for when your plans go boom and they just blow up. And when, you're, when we're reading it, you're going to think, how on earth is this psalm comfort for when my plans have gone awry because this entire psalm is happy, it's joyful, it's full of thanks, it's full of praise. Trust me, we'll get there. Psalm 100, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness and come before Him with joyful songs, know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For, his lo for, for the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Heavenly Father, when things blow up in our lives, God, let us enter your courts with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. In your name we pray. Amen. One of my favorite memories growing up is going to my granny's house for Thanksgiving. This was like the one time a year, all of my dad's side of the family, we would get together and we would play croquet, we'd watch football, we would eat fried turkey, and it was just unbelievable. And my granny would spend hours upon hours of cooking, and, all, and, the, and we would concentrate on the meal, but we didn't realize how, what the ingredients were that went with it. We just thought the final result was just, oh my goodness, this food is unreal. And when you look at Psalms 100, there are six things in there that we're to do. That is the, the meal. But I want us to concentrate this morning on the three simple ingredients that are in this 
psalm. The meal takes place in verses 1 and 2 and verse 4. Shout for joy. And the word means basically to be vocal, to hold nothing back. Basically, you worship at like you're at Sanford Stadium on a regular fall Saturday or maybe this, this, this season at your house. And you're yelling at the TV. Raise your voice. Worship with gladness. It's a combo of worship and service, but be glad. How many of you have come in here and seen people with just a... Just like, man, you need to go home because this is supposed to be the happiest place on earth. And you look like something is just going, just, you're just, it's just not right. It's not happy. You're not happy at this moment. Then come before him with joyful songs, more joy right there. Then in verse four, enter his gates. The language here means to access to the temple. You have access to the temple, which means you have access to the father. You have access to Jesus. Give thanks to the Lord for everything and praise His holy name. Those are the six things that we're to do. This entire psalm is happy, 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 joyful, 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 full of praise. And depending on who you're listening to, life hadn't gotten any better right now. Life has blown up for some of us. There's a pandemic going on, and depending on what news station you're watching or Facebook, it's either gotten worse, it's gotten better, or it's going to get worse. Your bank account is topsy-turvy right now. One minute, you're really good. The next minute, you have more bills than what you have in your account. There are other sicknesses going on besides COVID. You have family stuff that's going on. Will they stay in school all semester or all year? Half of the college football season has been canceled. So there's no national championship this year. So for Dogs fans, that's 40 years and counting with no national championship. So life is rough. And life sounds more like this psalm found in Psalm 55 than Psalm 100. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I am distraught because of what my enemy is saying, because the threats of the wicked, for they, have, they bring me down, they bring down suffering on me and assail me in anger. My heart is in anguish within me. Terrors of death have fallen on me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. Life all around me seems like one storm after another. So here's a disclaimer this morning for everybody online and everybody in the room. This message is not for everybody because some people are not going through a storm. And for you, yay! That's great! But you need to make a mental note because Priscilla Shire said this in a conference I went to in Dallas in February. She said there are three types of people. One, you're in the middle of a storm. Two, you're just coming out of a storm. Or three, you're sailing towards one. And so you need to make a mental note because this is life. You're either in the middle of a storm, you're coming out of one, or you're going into one. And if you've ever been in a massive storm like a hurricane, the only hurricane I've really ever experienced was Hurricane Hugo back in 1988. It's a Category 4 hurricane that hit um, South Carolina when I was 10. And all I remember was the wind. I couldn't hear anything else, but I just heard the wind of 135 miles an hour hitting my house, knocking down trees, and I was terrified. So how do we make Psalm 100 comfort food when our lives feel like Psalm 55? So let's look at the three little simple ingredients found in Psalm 100. Through the lens of a storm that Jesus took the disciples through in Matthew chapter 14. This is right after Jesus had fed the disciples. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed the crowd, he went up on a mountainside to pray by himself. Make a mental note of that right there. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted 
by the winds because the by the waves because the winds was against it. Why did Jesus send them to the other side? Jesus knew that there was a storm coming. If Jesus leads us into the middle of a storm, are we going to listen to him? You know, the disciples, were most of them were fishermen. They could probably tell when a storm was coming, but they continued to go. They continued to press through. Why? Because Jesus told them to go. So who are you listening to? You listening to Jesus or are you listening to everything else that's going on around you? Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. And this was at, shortly before dawn was between 3 and 6 a.m., this was the darkest time of the year, and so most people are asleep during this portion of the day. Why were they awake? Because they were fighting for their lives at this point. When the disciples had saw, saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. They start panicking at this point because they've been up all night, they're tired, and they thought they were seeing things. Remember in 2003, I had surgery for an injury that happened in college that I had put off for a couple of years. And the doctor gave me these pills that actually made me hallucinate. And I remember I was in our bed and I was just watching TV trying to recover. And all of a sudden, I honest to goodness thought my wife Sue came in the room with a knife to start to stab me. And I start screaming at the top of my lungs, get away from me, get away from me, get away from me. And then all of a sudden, the real Sue ran in the room and she's like, what's wrong? I said, you're trying to kill me. And she says, no, I'm not. I'm here to help you. And the disciples thought it was a ghost until what? Jesus said, hey, it's me. So the first ingredient, he says this, and Jesus says immediately, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. First simple ingredient is this. It's found in verse 3 of Psalm 100. No, he is God. Not was God. Not maybe God. He is God. Know that the Lord is God. How did they know it was Jesus instead of a ghost? Because he, he heard them. They heard him. Before cell phones and before call waiting and text messaging, if you needed to talk to somebody that wasn't at your house and you didn't want to drive over there, you actually had to pick up a phone and call and talk to somebody. And there are people in your life, even now, that you have that it's me people. The it's me people is the people that you can call and they can say, hey, it's me, and you know exactly who it is. You don't have to say, oh, or wait. You know who it is. Why? Because you know their voice. You spend time with them. And when Jesus said, take courage, it's me, they knew exactly who that was. Because they knew his voice, because they had spent time with him. John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, John says this, I write to you little children because you have known the Father. Verse 14, I have written to you fathers because you have known Him who is from the beginning. John says, I'm writing to you little children of the faith, people that have just given their lives to Christ. I'm writing to you seasoned veterans because everybody starts with ingredient number one. You have to know the Father. You have to know who he is. I got to go to Africa several years ago and I and went to Uganda and I got to go on a, a little safari. It wasn't a big, huge safari, but it was a little tiny one. I didn't get to see any lions. I was kind of depressed by that. And, uh, but I got to see zebra. I got to see zebra. And there's a, something very unique about zebra that what's in that picture right there is right in the middle of their forehead, their stripes... They're all unique to each individual zebra. And, and what the, what, when a mother has a baby zebra, she takes that zebra away from the herd for about three weeks. So that zebra can zero in on her forehead. That he, she or he can learn the mother's prints. And so when he goes back, he or she goes back to the herd, she knows, they know exactly who mama is. 
And when your life is going out of control or you're in the middle of a herd, you can look. If you know his voice, you can look and you know exactly who Jesus is. You know right where he is because you know the father because he says, take courage. It is I. It's me. And you cannot skip this step. Even if it's the, you, you may be the most seasoned vet, you've got to get this step right. You have to know that he is God because this is foundational to our beliefs. And so what was Jesus doing when he was walking on the lake? Before he was walking on the lake, he was actually spending time with the Father. You made a little note of it. And if Jesus can spend time with the Heavenly Father, why can't we? Adam, I'm so busy. You should see my schedule. Well, Jesus had thousands of people following him every day. And if you notice, when he said, take courage, it's me. It's me. The storm didn't stop there. The storm didn't stop. And Peter gets a little bit anxious because sometimes we want our circumstances to change before we obey. Sometimes we should obey and watch our circumstances change. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, there's still a little doubt. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Because Peter probably realizes that, you know what? This boat's about to top over. It's probably safer to be with Jesus in the middle of the lake. Jesus says, come. And Jesus says, come to me with your imperfections. Come to me with your doubt. Come to me with your fear. Just come. Because I'm God. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water. That's cool. He walked on the water. If you're reading this, he's the second man to ever walk on water. And he came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And he began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Why on earth did Peter take his eyes off of Jesus? Because he forgot simple ingredient number two. That we are his. It is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people. Peter knew Isaiah chapter 43 verse 1 when it says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Peter probably thought it was safer to walk to Jesus, but when he got out, he's like, this is awesome. I'm walking on water. And when we read this, we should think that. Oh my goodness, he's walking on water. And Peter is focused on Jesus, and Jesus is like, come on, man, you're my, you're my boy. Come on, let's go. And then he starts hearing everything from CNN and Fox News and Facebook, and he starts seeing the concerns of his, his own life that's just all around him at this moment. And he starts to take it. When he takes his eyes off of Jesus, that's when he starts to sink. And I love what Peter does here, and I love even more what Jesus does. When he starts to sink and he's taking his eyes off of Jesus, the first reaction that Peter says is, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reaches out his hand and he pulls him up. Jesus doesn't just say, what in the world, and push him down. He immediately picks him up. And here's something that, that I, 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 I was reading it this week and I was like, oh, this is something I've never noticed before. Maybe it's just because I'm not real smart. Um, when Jesus pulls him up, they still had to get back to the boat. So either Peter was walking on water after the doubt or Jesus was holding him up and carrying him. Either way is still really awesome. Because in the middle of our doubt, in the middle of our fear, Jesus is still working. No matter what you're doing, no matter what, if your eyes are not on him or not, you know why? Because we're his. And if we take our eyes off of him, he's still working in our lives. Even when we're sinking, even when we're, we're going down to the bottom, he reaches up and he pulls us out because he's still working in the middle of our doubt because we are his. 
And when they climbed back into the boat, the wind died down. And then, and then those that were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus might have said, Peter, why did you doubt, man? You were, you were walking on water. But I think Jesus understood that he got afraid. And he, re- he immediately reached his hand out and pulled him up, and they walked together because Jesus wasn't leaving one of his to drown. Then one of my last question that I had about this entire story was if you've ever been in a storm, when somebody is really close to you and you're in the middle of a storm, you still have to really raise your voice for them to hear you. Or if you've ever been in a garage and, and you're working on an engine, not me, but other, other real men, um, they're working on a garage, they're working on the engine and somebody revs the engine and you're, they're talking right here. They have to really scream for the next person to hear them. So my question is this, is how on earth did the disciples hear Jesus' voice? Let's say he was 50 yards away from them. They heard his voice. And I was, I was journaling about this and, and I asked that question several years ago. I was like, God, How did they hear your voice? How did they hear you? And I really felt the Holy Spirit say, because I was more powerful than the storm. Because I spoke over the storm. And if you've ever experienced that, I like to work out and... And I had surgery uh, right before we moved here. On my, I, had a, I tore my labrum in my shoulder. And my doctor had told me that you're never going to have full mo- range of motion. And every once in a while, you're, you're, your shoulder's just going to, like, not work for you. It's just going to, like, be really weak. And I remember I was working out, and I got to the bench press, and I put the warm-up weights on there, which is really lightweight. You just do it, you do it really quick to get warm, and then you put your heavy weights on. And I was doing my warm-up weight. Get it? And I put it down. My right shoulder worked. My left shoulder did not. And I couldn't move. And it was really lightweight. And I had to look around and say, help! And then this, this big guy comes in and he, he takes two fingers, pow, puts it up. And I was extremely embarrassed. But that was Jesus to the storm. He could calm that storm in two fingers if he wanted to. He's more powerful than the storm you're in right now. Is his voice more powerful than the storm? Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3 says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Ingredient number two. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And then Isaiah reminds us of the ingredients. For I am the Lord, your God, number one. And number two is I am am your God and the Holy One of Israel, number one again. And I am your Savior, number two. And this verse is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. A little sweet little lady handed this to me when I was in, in college and I was struggling with something that was going on and she handed me this verse and she just put it in. And she, put it, she handed me the verse and walked away. I don't even know who she is. And I just went and I read this verse and I was like, okay. But it doesn't say that I'll pick you up out of the fire and put you safely on the ground or I'll take you out of the storm. What does it say? I will be with you. The fire and the storm may be all around you, but you will not be burned. The waters will not sweep over you. Injured after an earthquake in the East. The tragic death of NBA legend Kobe Bryant. Coronavirus. COVID-19. All of Italy is going on lockdown. Countries such as Italy and Iran are in the middle of the battle. Elsewhere, the impact of COVID-19 is just beginning. Minneapolis on fire. This is getting serious. Oh, oh, oh my God. Got a little bit of a fire breaking out in the left hand side. Fires have been started.
just got out of control. The 2020 Summer Olympics, now the latest major sports cancellation caused by the global COVID-19 pandemic. The U.S. now has the highest number of COVID-19 related deaths. Hurricane Hannah slamming into the Texas shore. Was I think sometimes we could just think, you know what? I just really wish 2020 was over. Really wish it could just be over. Wish I could just get out of the storm that I'm living in. And it's easier to worship the Lord when the storm is done, when the storm is over, when things are smooth. But what if today we worshiped in spite of the storm, in the middle of the storm? If we read this Psalm 100, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, no matter if COVID is all around it. Worship the Lord with gladness when my life is falling apart. Come before Him with joyful songs. When I am down and I'm out, I can still sing with joy because I know that the Lord is God, that He is He that made us and we are His people, that I am His people the sheep of his pasture, that I can enter his gates with thanksgiving, no matter if I have nothing to be thankful for that I think of right now, and enter his courts with praise as soon as I walk in, my hands are up. And I give thanks to him and I praise him. And this is here in verse five is the last ingredient. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Simple ingredient number three is His love endures. Endures means to continue in the same state, no matter if it's sunny outside or if it's a storm. Jesus will get you through it. He doesn't change even if you're in a storm. He's the same person He was when it was a good day. He's the same in smooth weather and He's the same in rough seas. My favorite, my favorite story in Scripture of all time is Mark chapter 5 when Jesus is walking with Jairus and Jairus has told him, my daughter is dead. My daughter is dying. Can you come and, and heal her? And Jesus agrees and they're walking. And it's people, somebody comes to him and says, Jairus, your daughter is dead. And then it says the only words that Jesus is recorded saying to Jairus, don't be afraid just believe my love for you will endure I'll get you to the other side Jairus he will get you to the other side if you're going through a storm and then the final verse in Mark Matthew chapter 14 verse 34 this is something that we kind of just always kind of blow over when they had crossed over they landed in Genesaret Jesus got him through the storm. He got him to the other side. And no matter the storm you're going through this morning, no matter the storm that you may face two years from now, if you take these simple ingredients, and number one, you know that he's God and his voice is louder than your storm. But are we allowing CNN to be louder? Are we allowing Fox News to be louder than Jesus? Are we allowing Facebook to be louder? Are we allowing the circumstances of your life to be louder than the voice of Jesus in your life? Because we need to understand that number two is we're His and He's not, He's gonna be with us through the storm. Think about the skit tonight, this morning. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't wake up that day and say, hey, let's go get thrown in a fiery, fiery furnace. And then when they got thrown in, who was with them? Jesus was with them. Jesus didn't get taken back because they got thrown in the fiery furnace. He didn't get surprised by it. Why? Because his love endures forever. 